Jesus Christ died, we died with him. Though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. Um, my title for this morning is, We're Living in the Last Days. Uh, you know, yes, we are. Now, you might not realize this, but that's why I'm doing this message, so you will understand that we are living in the last days. Are you aware of this, that we're living in the last days? You know, hopefully, when you hear a statement like this, the first question you ask is what? Right, last days of what? I mean, do we just assume we understand what last days mean? And so we say, yeah, we're in the last days. I could be talking about the last shopping days until Christmas. You only have four, four I don't know how many you got left. <laughs> I'm not really worried about it. <laughs> I love when people ask me, are you ready for Christmas? I'm like, what do you have to do to be ready for it? <laughs> I said, my wife does anything that needs to be done. I just, I'm there. All right. When I say we're in the last days, I could be referring to the last days of 2014. Time's running out. Or I could be talking on a more encouraging note, we are in the last days of the Obama administration. <laughs> Hopefully. Now, if I was referring to any of those things, I'd be correct. But what is really sad is that when most Christians hear that we're in the last days, they never ask the question, Last days of what? They see the phrase last days used in the Bible, and they don't stop to ask, what's this talking about? They assume it's referring to the last days of the world. The last days of planet Earth. I think most Christians today, and I do mean most, would probably say that we, 21st century American Christians, are living in the last days of planet Earth. That's the eschatology of most Christians today. The earth, everything is about to end soon. This is a commonly held view. One Bible commentator wrote this. Do we see the sign of the times? <laughs> I love it. Everything's a sign of the times, you know? Everything that happens. You know, you hear on TV, that's a sign of the times. Mark this, he says, Paul wrote, there will be terrible times in the last days. And what do we see now? America at war. Has there been a time America hasn't been at war? Shootings in our schools. Disasters in the weather. It's all coming to a climax. Will World War III soon be upon us? We are living in the last days. Now by last days, this man means the last days of planet Earth. There are many today who believe we are living in the last days of the planet because of the different things they see, the turmoil in the Middle East, technological advancements. Every time some new technology comes out, someone's quoting Daniel, you know. Oh, knowledge will increase. We're in the last days. The new world order, etc. They claim these are all fulfillments of biblical prophecy that prove we're in the last days. Well, Let's do something this morning. Let's look at what the Bible has to say about the last days and see if we can come to an understanding of what exactly it means. I think that most everyone would agree that the last days began in the times of Christ. All right? Most Christians would agree with that. Look at Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, so He's saying in the past... God spoke through the prophets in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. So the writer of Hebrews says the day first century Christians were in the last days. Now most Christians would agree that the last days began at the time of Christ but the big debate comes over when do the last days end. Now hopefully our study this morning will help us answer that question. Now, in order to understand the term last days, let's look at how the phrase is originally used in the Hebrew Scriptures. If you come across something in the New Testament you don't understand, nah, let me take that back. 
If you come across something in the New Testament you think you understand, okay, don't just think you know what it means unless you get the meaning from the Tanakh. See, you've got to understand the first three quarters of the book. Everything in the New Testament comes from the Old Covenant, from the Tanakh, and you have to understand the language there. So if you want to understand what last days means, go back there and figure out what it used, how it's used there. The Bible's first use of the phrase last days is found in Genesis. <clears throat> then Yaakov, this is the complete Jewish Bible, Yaakov called for his sons and says, Gather yourselves together, and I will tell you what shall happen to you in the Aharit Ha'amim. All right, now that is a term. Aharit Ha'amim, that Hebrew means last days. I don't like the way the New American Standard translates this. We'll look at that in a minute. But uh, this is, it's talking about the last days. Now consider carefully to whom the phrase last days is primarily addressed here. Jacob is talking to his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, and he pronounces the general evil that will come upon them. So clearly Israel is the subject of the last days. And the last days concern Israel. So if you, use, if you start at the very first use and you develop that understanding, you got it made as you move on through the Scriptures. Look at Numbers 24. Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything contrary to the command of Yahweh, either good or bad, of my own accord. But while Yahweh speaks, that will I speak. And now behold... I'm going to my people. Come, and I'll advise you what, what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Now, this is what I'm talking about. The New American Standard translates days to come. makes it sound like, ah, just sometime in the future. But that's not from the Hebrew. It is here in the Hebrew. It is aharit. It is the last days. That's what the complete Jewish Bible says here. Aharit, hayamim. The King James says the latter days. Young's literal says in the latter end of the days. So we see the vision is concerning the Jews, and it was concerning what would happen to Israel in their last days. Isaiah predicts these last days as well. In Isaiah 2, 1 and 2, he says, The world which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised among the hills and all nations will stream unto it. All right, people, first thing we have to understand, this is apocalyptic language. All right, we're not, literal mountains are not the idea here. Mountains are depicted as the dwelling place of Yahweh. And he says the, the message here is concerning Judah and Jerusalem and it's about their last days. It's speaking about the inauguration of the new covenant. Nowhere is this phrase last days used to, refer, used to refer to a physical planet. It's referring to the last days of the nation of Israel. Now Moses confirms that the last days of national Israel will be characterized by devastation and their ultimate scattering. Deuteronomy 4.27 And Yahweh will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Yahweh shall drive you. 4.30 says, When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you will return to Yahweh your God <clears throat> and listen to His voice. He continues this idea toward the end of the book in Deuteronomy 31. He says, For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. For you will do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. So Moses says evil is going to befall you in the latter days. And the you here is Israel. That's who he's talking to. There's no reference to Gentiles being the subject of the latter days. Always it's directed to Israel. In Jeremiah 23, it says, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. 
They speak a vision of their own imaginations, not from the mouth of Yahweh. They speak saying to those who despise me, Yahweh has said, you will have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say, calamity will not come upon you. But who has stood in the counsel of Yahweh, that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listen? Behold, the storm of Yahweh has gone forth in wrath, even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purpose of his heart in the last days. You will clearly understand it. So throughout the book of Jeremiah, God condemns these Jewish false prophets. And here Jeremiah predicts that when these last days come, the people of Yahweh will understand what he has been trying to tell this nation because he is going to punish them for their wickedness. Now Yahweh through Ezekiel warns Israel of their destruction by the hand of foreign nations. Ezekiel 38. And you will come up against my people who are his people. It's Israel. My people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will come upon, it will come about in the last days that I shall bring you against my land in order that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through you before their eyes, O God. Michael the archangel speaks to Daniel, associating the latter days with Daniel's people, who are again is Israel. He says, now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people, Daniel's people are Israel, in the latter days. For the vision pertains to days yet future. Now, Israel's Daniel's people here, and the time of this writing is about 536 B.C., and he says that the vision of what will happen to Israel in the latter days is a long way off. He says the vision pertains to days yet future. So in Daniel's time, the last days were a long way off. Now Hosea talks about how the elect remnant will turn to Yahweh in the last days. In Hosea 3.5. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to Yahweh and to his goodness in the last days. This is talking about Israel trusting their Messiah in the last days. Finally, in Micah, the prophet states that the last days involve the destruction of physical Israel and the establishment of true Israel. That's really important when you read this, that you understand he's talking about Israel being destroyed, he's talking about Israel being revived, but it's not the same Israel that he's talking about. In Micah 3.12, Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become a high place of a forest. Here we see the destruction of natural Israel. They're going to be destroyed. But watch what he says in 4.1. It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the people will will stream into it. Again, he's talking about those coming to Christ in the last days. Now, in order to understand these verses, you have to understand that there are two Israels. Fundamental to understanding Scripture. And Romans 9, 6 really makes this clear. It is not as though the Word of God has failed. See, Israel, people are in Israel are saying, well, that, if, if the Gentiles are being blessed with our blessing, then His promises have been void to us. That's wrong. God's going back on His promises. No, he says, the word of God hasn't failed. Here's the problem. They're not all Israel, true Israel, real Israel, spiritual Israel, who are descended from physical, national Israel. See, Israel is not a term like Ammon or Moab or Greece or Rome. It can't be defined in terms of physical descent or understood simply on the human side. It's created not by blood, not by soil, but by the promise of Yahweh. And within national Israel, there is true Israel, spiritual Israel. And most of Israel 
was faithless. All those in the green there of national Israel, they just were going along with the motions. They were not trusting God. They didn't trust in the Messiah. But in the midst of that, you had true Israel. True Israel was part of national Israel. So when he says they are not all Israel, he's speaking of the yellow circle there, they're not all true Israel that are descended from Israel, even though they're in that bigger circle, they're not the remnant. They're not part of the true Israel. Now the dispensationalist says God is going to defend national Israel in his time. And there's coming a day in the future God's going to defend national. That is the exact opposite of what is true. Yahweh said that there was going to be an end to some aspect of Israel and a resurrection of something else. Yahweh was going to destroy her nationally, politically, but raise her spiritually. Amos 5, 2, and 3 says, She has fallen. She will not rise again, the virgin Israel. That sounds complete. She's fallen. She's not going to get back up. She lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. And the one that goes forth a hundred strong will have ten left to the house of Israel. There's going to be a destruction of national Israel. But he says, spiritual Israel is going to be revived. Amos 9.11 In that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David, wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. People say, see, Israel's coming back. This is not referring to physical national Israel. Booth here refers to the family line. Yahweh said that he's going to destroy and rebuild Israel, meaning that national Israel is going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out, never to rise again. But spiritual Israel will rise from the ruins. Paul taught this throughout the book of Galatians, trying to stress the fact that, listen, it doesn't have to do with who you're born of. It has to do with your faith. Galatians 3, 6, and 7. Even so, Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it's those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. People from a certain lineage are going to say, we're sons of Abraham. Well, no, you're not, the Scripture says. And it's those who are of faith, and only those who are of faith, who are sons of Abraham. It has nothing to do with physical descent. Galatians 3.9 So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. The blessing comes, that's come, the Abrahamic covenant, the blessing there, it comes through faith and only through faith. Galatians 3.16 Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. You know, people see that, yes, the seed, they think, those are all the descendants of Abraham. Watch what it says. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to a whole bunch, many, but rather to one, and to your seed, singular. That is Christ. Now, notice who the promise is to here. The Abrahamic covenant and his promises were made to Abraham and to Abraham's singular seed, which is Christ. The only way anybody gets in on the blessings of this covenant is through union with Christ by faith. 329, and if you belong to Christ, and that is by faith, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. See, it's evident, or at least it should be, that physical Israel was the main subject involved in these texts dealing with last days. The last days came, and Yahweh destroyed Israel. The nation of Israel has not existed for 2,000 years. Now, I know the dispensationalists, a lot of people want to argue. No, oh, they're over there now. 1948, they became a nation again. Listen, that has nothing to do with the Bible. That is a group of people who wanted a homeland. They can't trace their ancestry back and say they're true Jews it's just the people who want to, you know, have that land and they've taken it over and they've claimed that they're Israel. 
National Israel was destroyed in AD 70. Listen, what, up, what made Israel Israel was God's calling. God made them his people. He gave them a temple. He gave them priests. He gave them sacrifices. And he took every one of those things away in AD 70. And so since then, they've had nothing and they are not Israel anymore because there's no priesthood. There's no sacrifice. There's no temple. It's done. Those in the Middle East who affirm themselves as Israel don't have any right biblically to do so. There is no Jewish race today. You just look that up in any encyclopedia. Anybody that deals with anthropology will tell you there's not a race of Jews. The last days were the last days of Israel, and the last days ended when Israel came to an end in 8070. And I don't know how you take a biblical faith that God established. God put together, gave you all the rules for it, and everything changes in 8070 because no longer do we sacrifice. We don't have any priests. We don't have any temple. But we just keep right on going. We won't miss a beat. We'll just change a few things around and we'll say it's all the same. We just keep on going. How, how do they do that? They have a bloodless Passover that they, that they enjoy every year, which has no meaning. All right, let's look at the New Testament and see if we can't verify some of these truths. In the book of Acts, we read a profound statement by Peter, who was a Jew, to a multitude of Jews out of every nation. He says, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. They are filled with the Spirit, and they say, oh, these guys are drunk. For it's only the third hour of the day. In other words, come on, people don't get drunk this early, right? <clears throat> but this, he says, let me tell you what it is. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And, and it shall be in the last days, God says. I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now let me ask you a couple questions here. Who's Peter talking to? Well, men of Judea and Jerusalem, right? That's who he's talking to. When did Peter say this? He said it in the first century, and he said this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. He explains that what the multitude of Jews were experiencing was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Peter's telling this multitude that first century Jews were in the last days. Now beyond this, he goes on to describe what would take place in these last days. <clears throat> and I believe Joel's prophecy, and I believe as Peter quotes this prophecy in Acts 2, this prophecy is a 40-year prophecy. He talks about the beginning, the Spirit coming upon them, and the Spirit did come upon them at Pentecost. And most people look at this like this is a just one event. It happens in an instant, boom, they get the Spirit and the judgment. You know, there, there's a blessing here of the Spirit coming upon them, and then there's also judgment 40 years later for those who do not get in on the blessing. He goes on to say, I will grant wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of Yahweh shall come. But immediately, now, all right, notice how what he says here, and this is dealing with the judgment, okay? This is now he's moved away from the blessing that came at Pentecost. Forty years later, it's going to come upon judgment to those who don't trust in the Messiah. Notice Yeshua's words and how similar they are to Joel's prophecy here in Matthew 24. Yeshua says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. You take these two together, you take the prophecy from Acts 2 and Matthew, put them together, you see it's the same thing. There. The sun's going to be turned to blood, the sun's going to be darkened, the moon won't give its light. Peter and Yeshua are saying the same thing. Yeshua spoke these words in answer to the disciples' questions and the question the disciples asked him that he's answering is, when is this going to happen? Let's look at that, Matthew 24. Yeshua came out from the temple. Okay, got that? That's really important. He's coming, he's leaving the temple. And was going away when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. 
Get it, he's telling to They're leaving the temple. They're saying, look at They're pointing at the temple. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? The things are the temple. Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. People, that is monumental, okay? This thing was a fortress. This thing was huge, surrounded by walls. Huge, huge stones built this thing up. And to think it's going to be all torn down, not a single stone left? Why would that even happen? It would be, you know, if you even destroyed the place, you captured it, why would you tear up every stone? In verse 3, it says, As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now the question is twofold. First they ask, when? When is this going to happen? When is this temple going to be torn down? Now these things refers to the temple's destruction in verse 2. In verse 1, the disciples point out the temple buildings. In verse 2, Yeshua says all these things will be destroyed. It should be clear. They're asking, when will the temple be destroyed? When will our house be left desolate? After all he said about the judgment in chapter 23, and about not one stone being left upon another, the disciples' response is, when? When's that going to happen? And the second part of the question is, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Now, if you compare all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see that the disciples consider the coming and the end of the age to be identical events with the destruction of the temple. See, they connected all those. The temple's destroyed, the Son of Man is coming, the parousia, the judgment all happens. The end of the age, it's all connected. Look at Mark 13, 4. Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Notice in the first part of the verse, he says, when will these things be? Referring to the temple's destruction. Then the second half, he asks, what will be the sign of all these things being fulfilled? The sign of his coming and the end of the age was the same as the these things which referred to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year AD 70. Disciples had one thing and only one thing in their mind, and that was the destruction of the temple. With the destruction, they connected the coming of Messiah and the end of the Jewish age. Now, of course, the Jewish age is going to end if the temple is destroyed. All right? So their question was, when will the end be? Yeshua tells them quite clearly that the end would come in their generation. Matthew 24, 34. Truly I say to you, <laughs> let me ask you just a weird question here. Who's the you? That those people that he's talking to. You know, people say, see you, I tell you, he's talking to us. You weren't there. This is a real conversation being recorded, okay? And he's talking to these people. He says, I say to you, first century audience, this generation. Oh man, what people do to that is so crazy. Listen. It does not say that generation. Could he have said that? Yeah. <laughs> no, he couldn't have because he was referring to that generation. This generation, what he's talking about. He could have used the far demonstrative, that generation. In other words, some generation far out. He said this generation, the near demonstrative, meaning the one I'm speaking to. It won't pass away until all these things, everything I've talked about, takes place. Everything. The word generation means contemporaries, those who live at the same time. It is amazing what people try to do to that verse. Like he's talking to some future generation. In other words, when these things start happening, then that generation will see. That's not the context at all. That's not how they would have understood this at all. And we have to look at it through their eyes, or we're going to be way off base. So the age that was the end was the Jewish age. It would end with the destruction of the Jewish temple and the city. It was not the last days of planet Earth. Guess what? Earth still went on after that. But let me tell you what. The Jewish world ended. The old covenant age ended. The disciples knew that the fall of the temple, the destruction of the city meant the end of the old covenant and the inauguration of a new age. Look at Matthew 24, 29 again where he's these modern commentators generally understood this and what follows as the end of the world. 
But that's not consistent with biblical language. I mean, people read this in 24 and they say, see, the sun's dark and the moon will not give its light. This is, this is the, the world's coming to an end in Matthew 24. Is this talking about global destruction? Again, people, if you're not familiar with apocalyptic language used in the Tanakh, you'll never understand what Christ is saying here. Christ is a Jew. He's familiar with the Jewish scriptures. He is quoting from Jewish scriptures. And that's why that's in a bold there, capital letters there. It's a quote. From the Tanakh. This language is common in the Old Covenant prophets. The idea is seen clearly as we look at passages that mention the destruction of different states, different governments that sound like the end of the world. Let's just look at one, Isaiah 13. He says, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, who do you think he's writing this oracle about? It's the oracle, all right? The word oracle in the Hebrew is Massah, and it means an utterance of doom. So he's pronouncing an utterance of doom on, watch, Babylon. All right, you have got to keep that in mind as you read through chapter 13. Because that's, he tells us, this is who it's for. It's not an oracle against the universe. It's not an oracle against the world. It's an oracle against Babylon. Verse 6 says, Wail, for the day of Yahweh is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Now, in, in 13, 9 through 13, he says this, Behold, the day of Yahweh is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make a land of desolation. He will exterminate its sinners from it, for the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. Now, if you take that literally... All the stars went out. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. So, these are the same words used by Peter and Yeshua talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Thus, I will punish the world for its evil. Remember, who is he talking about here? Babylon. He hasn't expanded it to every sink to the whole globe. No, he's talking about their world. He says, for it's evil and the wicked for their iniquity, I also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of Yahweh of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Now remember, this is written to Babylon. But it sounds like a world is being destroyed. The terminology of a context cannot be expanded beyond the scope of the subject under discussion. He hasn't changed the spectrum to the world. If you were a Babylonian and Babylon was destroyed, it would seem like the world came to an end, wouldn't it? Because it would have come to an end for Babylon. And for you, if you live in Babylon and they're being destroyed, guess what? Your world just ended. The stars went out for you. Sun's dark. It's total collapse and you're done. Do you really care what's happening anywhere else? No, because your world just ended. That's who he's talking to here. Verse 17, Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. This is a historical event, people, that took place in 539 B.C. When the Medes destroyed Babylon, the Babylonian world came to an end. The destruction is said, look what he says in verse 6, the destruction from the Almighty. But the Medes do it. Because Yahweh is using the Medes to carry out his plan. And the Medes constitute the means that Yahweh uses to accomplish this. Again, this is apocalyptic language. This is the way the Bible discusses the fall of a nation. It's obviously figurative. Yahweh didn't intend for us to take this literally. If you take this literally, people, guess what? The world ended in 539 B.C., and you and I are not really here. Okay? So it's kind of hard to take it literally. You know, if you take this as a globe-ending event, as we have seen, the last days concern the last days of the nation Israel. In fact, the very first mention of the last days that we saw was by Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? 
Well, more importantly, Jacob was addressing the 12 sons or tribes and speaking about the evil that would befall those tribes in the last days. Now, the question is, how does this relate to the language of Yeshua and Peter and speaking of the sun, moon, and stars? Well, that's all kind of connected. Do you remember Joseph's dream that he had, which maybe he shouldn't have shared with his family? Huh? Genesis 37, 9. Now, he had still another dream. Now, remember here, Joseph's the least favorite son. He's the favorite of the father. The brothers don't like him. He's got ten brothers. They don't like him because daddy likes him best, okay? So they don't like him at all. So he comes to these brothers who don't like him, all older than him, and he says, hey, I had another dream. And related to his brothers, he said, lo, I had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. Wow, this makes him sound like he's pretty important, doesn't it? Now, is Joseph's dream about the literal sun, moon, and stars bowing to him? How, would that, how did the sun bow? How would that happen? You know, this may confuse us, right? Because you're saying sun, moon, and stars. How are they going to bow down to him? But you know what? Joseph's father wasn't confused at all. And if you just read the next verse, you see he's not confused. Look what he says. What is this dream that you have had? Now watch. Shall I and your mother... And your brothers, oh, who's that? I, the sun, your mother, the moon, and your brother, the stars, actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And Josephus said, yeah, you're going <laughs> to. <laughs> Jacob, he interprets this dream as referring to himself, his wife, and their sons who were the heads of the 12 tribes identified as the sun, moon, and stars, respectively. See, they represented the foundation of the whole Jewish nation. And when Yeshua, therefore, spoke of the sun being dark and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling from heaven, he's not referring to the end of the solar system, but of the complete destruction of the Jewish state. Peter is addressing this same event. Again, people, we get our understanding from the Tanakh, from its first uses. And it's interesting how his father understood exactly what was happening. It's so awesome to read this whole story and you just read through Genesis, you know, just read it and it's just like you're done and you're in awe of Yahweh. I, my favorite part is when Jacob cries out when his sons come back and we left one of the brothers and, you know, he wants to see Benjamin. Where, you know, he goes, all these things are against me. And I'm thinking, no, they're not. You'd starve to death if this wasn't happening. All these things are for you. You just don't get it right now. How often, people, how often in our lives are we at that point point? we just cry, all these things are against me? But we don't see the big picture. And all Yahweh says is, will you just trust me? Will you just trust me? I have this under control. And that's why that story is so cool. You can read all the way to the end and see, man. It does frustrate me a little that Joseph is so nice to his brothers. I think I would have played along a little more. I think I would have tormented them a little bit more before I, you know. Because you, can you imagine Joseph, though, when the brothers first come in and they bow down before him? I mean, can you, his heart probably skips a little bit of a beat. The hair stands up on the back. He goes, remember I had that dream? Here's my brother bowing before me. Man, powerful, powerful story, people. In the prophetic language, great commotions, and revolutions upon the earth are often represented by commotions and changes in the heavens. None of these things literally took place. But the brothers literally did bow to Joseph. So we saw in Acts 2 that Peter was claiming that Joel's prophecy was being fulfilled. And they were in the last days. As we saw earlier, the writer of Hebrews expressed this identical sentiment as he began his discourse comparing the, the fading of the old covenant to the coming in of the everlasting new covenant. He says, in these last days has spoken to us by his son. He was speaking, Yeshua was speaking in the last days. What last days? The last days of the old covenant. The last days of Judaism. Look at Hebrews 9, 26. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When was it that Yeshua appeared? He was born not at the beginning, but at the end of the ages. 
Now suppose that this meant that Yeshua's incarnation came near the end of the world would make this statement totally false. The world's already lasted longer since the incarnation than the whole duration of the Mosaic economy. How can your last days be longer than any of your days? Last days is the implying there's the last of the days. There's not that many of them. Yeshua was manifested at the end of the Jewish age. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 1.20. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. He came during the last days of the old covenant age. Certainly the writers of the New Testament were aware that these passages that we've been studying involve the last days of Judah, the last days of Jerusalem. Therefore it's safe, and I think it's logical to say, that the New Testament writers believed that they were in the last days of the Jewish age. Paul believed they were living in the end of the age. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now these things happened to them, for an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. You know, people read these verses today and they say, yeah, that's us, the end of the ages have come upon us. How long are these end of ages? How long do they go on? First century saints, that's who Paul's writing to. James taught this same thing in James chapter 5. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Something's coming real soon that he's talking about. He says, your riches have rotted. Your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is rusted, and they will ru that the rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Clearly, James taught these men were living in the last days, and John taught this too. Now, John's getting closer to the end, so he doesn't say last days. He said, it is the last hour. And just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, watch, John says, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. And people today are looking for the Antichrist. Well, he, he was appeared back in that day, okay? For this we know it is the last hour. The last hour of the Jewish age. You know, there are many other passages that could be used to support the fact that the First century believers, and particularly the apostles, believed that they were in the end of the Jewish age or the last days of the Jewish age. And contrary to popular opinion, we're not living in what the Bible calls last days. We're certainly in the last days of shopping before Christmas 2014. We're in the last days of 2014. And we are hopefully in the last days of the Obama administration. But we are not in the biblical last days. Those refer to the last days of the old covenant Israel. We are now living in the new covenant age. And I don't think any Christian would deny that. You ask a Christian, is this a new covenant? Yeah, well, where's the old? Well, the old's still there. They got the old in the mixed. They, you know, they're still living in the transition period, basically. It's for going on forever. The new covenant age, here's what we have to understand, has no last days. Amen is right. Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Yeshua our Lord. People, the new covenant is an eternal covenant. It has no last days. We are living literally in the first days of the eternal age. Missing this important time statement causes people to misapply by nearly 2,000 years many verses in the Bible. We, un, we have to, it's fundamental to understanding the scripture that you know what time it is. Or you'll mess everything up. The old heavens and earth of Judaism have passed away. And we now live in the new heavens and the new earth of the new covenant. May Yahweh help us to fully understand and appreciate our position in the new heaven and new earth where the scripture says righteousness dwells. Now this doesn't mean that the whole world and everybody's living righteously. No, the new covenant is where righteousness dwells, and we are righteous because we are in Christ. Yahweh dwells now with His people. There's no separation for us. We can be in His presence 24-7. We are in His presence. We can go to Him any time with prayer requests. People, the age we live in is glorious. And how sad it is that so many don't, don't understand it and don't appreciate it. They're looking forward to something they already have. That's kind of a sad state to be in. There's no last days. There's no doom and gloom. There's no, you know, the world's going to blow up pretty soon. No. We're here. 
We might be here for a long time. Now, we're all leaving at a point in time. Okay, how long will the earth go on? Maybe it'll just keep going on. They say, oh, no, it's winding down. Don't believe everything science tells you, okay? They're a little off track in how all the things work here. But I think what we need to understand is, you know, we need to learn to talk to people about this whole last days thing and take them to the scripture and just teach them from the scripture what the last days are all about. I think once they get that, they can move in <laughs> to the new covenant age and enjoy the glories of the new covenant in the presence of Yeshua. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to look at your word. Lord, I thank you that it just seems so clear. If we just take the whole book and learn from the very beginning and follow the language and learn to understand the language of your people. Thank you, Lord, for the time in which we live. Lord, I thank you that I'm not looking for a judgment to come, a disaster, an end of the planet Earth, but that day by day, we have the, the privilege, the great privilege, Lord, to dwell in your presence. Thank you, Father. Help us to learn to trust you. Lord, help us to look at that story of Joseph and be encouraged, Father, that you have it all under control. Teach us, Lord, to rest in you. Amen. Amen.